We want to thank the movie-going audience so much, especially those that grew up with Toy Story. Um, we hope that your adventures with Woody and Buzz made growing up a little bit easier. Please, please remember this for later. I've made it no secret that I absolutely despise Toy Story 4 with the burning intensity of a thousand supernova explosions. I've mentioned it in what is probably a cumulative hundreds of Let's Play videos at this point, be it as an offhanded comment or as a mini rant, promising to one day make a video elaborating on that position ever since I ripped Danganronpa 3 a new one. And now the time has finally come. And what better day to start talking about this movie than on the two year anniversary of the day it released on Blu-ray. Well, actually, that was a much better day to do this, but we all know how well June went for me. Toy Story 4 is a colossal failure from almost every aspect of storytelling. The plot is less cohesive than Swiss cheese. The characters are all shells of their former selves, and that's putting it very lightly in some instances. The consistency of the cause and effect is equivalent to that of a game of Bunko, where characters either get insanely lucky or insanely unlucky, depending on whatever the plot requires. And there is irreparable damage dealt to the world-building of the Toy Story universe, accomplished with nothing more than a frenetic and corbantic eating utensil. This film would be in tatters, even even if it existed solely in a vacuum with no connection to any other pre-existing material. But sadly, it doesn't. It doesn't just exist in a vacuum. It is the fourth and final entry in one of the most beloved animated film series of all time. And what it does to its predecessors is utterly unforgivable. It's indefensible. This movie has mercilessly, you might even say maliciously, annihilated every single substantive aspect of the original three movies. Every character arc, every story beat, every lasting message, everything that was at the beating heart and soul of that trilogy was doused in gasoline, lit on fire, and then promptly nuked by this complete and utter train wreck of a film, written and directed by a man who claims to love Toy Story with all his heart, and who hides behind that thinly veiled guise of adoration in every single interview when the fruits of his efforts couldn't possibly serve as a more blatant contradiction to that idea if he was trying. Oh. Are you wondering what I mean by all that? Wondering how I could possibly speak ill of a Pixar movie? Especially when it has been nominated for and subsequently won an Oscar for being the best animated feature? And received almost unanimous positive praise across the internet? As if that means anything at all. Well, if you find yourself faced with those questions, if you watch this movie and genuinely believe it to be a masterpiece, that it's the perfect conclusion to the Toy Story series, or even if you just believe that it's not that bad of a movie, then buckle up, everyone. Throughout the next five videos, I'll take you on a journey through the world of Toy Story 4, covering every last thing that this film destroyed, from plot to characters to world building to themes and messaging, with timestamps in the description, signposting each subject for your viewing convenience. So then, without further ado, I invite you to sit back and relax as I finally tear this pile of rancid sewage to shreds with the same fervor and passionate hatred that the writers had when they wiped out the original trilogy. We begin with the opening logo present in front of every Walt Disney Animated Studios feature film since Pirates of the Caribbean and Dead Man's Chess. Why are we starting here instead of just skipping straight to the opening prologue, you may ask? Well, because it's not the logo itself that I'm interested in here. It's the music. Does this sound familiar to any of you? No? Well, it certainly should. Yup, the track that plays when Woody first arrives at Al's apartment is exactly the same as the track that opens up Toy Story 4. But why does that matter, you may ask? Why bother talking about the opening musical track of the movie? It's just supposed to be an easily identifiable Toy Story tune to quickly pull you back into this world. No harm, no foul. Hey, you know what? Maybe you're right. Maybe I'm looking too far into things. Maybe we should just let this one go and enjoy the movie. Let's just enjoy the movie, shall we? Though you may still want to keep this topic in mind on the off chance it comes back up again later. Not that that would ever happen. Hi, my name is Josh Cooley. I am the director of Toy Story 4. And I am Mark Nielsen, producer on Toy Story 4. Hi, Mark. Hey there, Josh. Would you like to go see a film? I hear Toy Story 4 is in theater. I hope we can get tickets. Oh, yeah. By the way, I'll also be referencing the director commentary track occasionally throughout this video. Director Josh Cooley and producer Mark Nielsen will be popping up every now and again whenever they have something particularly interesting to say. And I think you'll find some of their commentary to be quite enlightening. The film properly opens on a dark and stormy night nine years ago. But why nine years ago? Well, the reason why they've chosen to create a nine-year time gap between this flashback and the events of Toy Story 4 is because in the real world, it had been nine years between the releases of Toy Story 3 and 4. So the audience is supposed to see this text and think, ah, I see, that makes sense, based on meta-knowledge of the film's release dates. Except that this scene takes place in Andy's house from Toy Story 2 when he's still a kid, when in Toy Story 3, 
He was already 17 years old, ready to go off to college. Meaning that despite what the deceptive flashback text is trying to get you to think about, this is not referring to the in-real-life time gap of 9 years. It is instead referring to the in-universe time gap of 9 years between an unspecified time after Toy Story 2 and the main events of Toy Story 4, which appears to be totally fine on the surface of things. I just hope we don't come across anything later that, when considered in conjunction with this information, makes the entire crux of this film's ending harder to swallow than an ostrich egg. Anyway, on this dark and stormy night, Andy comes bursting back into his room carrying several of his toys in his arms, having just run back inside after playing out in the rain. He then runs off to go wash his hands for dinner and leaves the toys back in his bedroom, but all is not well as we soon discover that in his mad dash to get back inside, he missed a toy. RC is out amidst the storm struggling for survival. I don't know how the hell Andy could have possibly missed the largest toy out of this group, as well as the one whose mechanics would be most endangered by a rainstorm as a motorized remote control car, but whatever. Wait, why was he even playing out in the driveway in the first place when he has a giant backyard to play in? Oh, is it so he can have a more stable surface to drive RC around on? Because if that's the case, then he has even less of an excuse to not have brought RC back into the house since he would have been the sole reason that he would have gone outside in the first place. Wait a minute, where's RC's remote? He's not holding it in his hands when he comes running into the room. D did you go outside to play with RC without the literal remote you need to have in order to control RC? You... What? Oh, whatever. Okay, so Woody immediately loops into action since he never leaves a toy behind, and someone's Buzz, Jesse, and Slinky to come with him to Molly's room. Upon entering, Woody takes a solid 10 seconds to stand around staring mindlessly at the light projections from Bo Peep's lamp despite the fact that RC is literally fighting for his life outside right now. I sure hope these precious seconds don't make things way harder for you than they otherwise would have been. Turns out the reason why we had a staring contest with the floor for 10 seconds was because we had to wait for Molly to prance her way out of the room. Despite the fact that Andy's mom called her kids down for dinner nearly half a minute ago at this point, and we don't see anything over in this side of the room that would have been keeping her busy, so what the heck took her so long? Moving on, Woody wastes even more time slinking around the corner despite the fact that he now knows the exact locations of all three family members as he watched both kids run down the stairs to the dinner table and heard the mom call him from downstairs before finally sprinting across Molly's room as we come face to face with Bo Peep? Uh, guys, do, do you remember her outfit from the first two movies? Because it wasn't this, I can tell you that much. It may appear to be the same on a superficial level. She still has her iconic crook that got Pixar put on PETA's watch list. She has her classic bonnet, and she has her classic dress. Except here's the thing, that's not her dress. Go back and watch the first two movies. Her dress is a rigid object that does not react to movement the way a human's dress would due to the nature of her design. Yes, it still flows with the wind somewhat, but it doesn't drift back towards her body like a normal dress. It remains in this rigid umbrella-style shape as if there's a wireframe inside permanently holding it up. It's most obvious in this shot from Toy Story 2, where she is literally dangling in mid-air, yet the dress remains perfectly rigid and doesn't shift even a little bit with gravity. But that's not all. It is very clear in the original movies that her walking abilities are heavily impaired because she's not supposed to be a child plaything. She's not supposed to be an action figure, she's supposed to be a lamp. A porcelain lamp accessory that isn't meant to be handled by children. Which is why she's always shown to be wobbling around instead of the more natural walking animations that are gifted to the other characters. Now, you may be thinking, okay, so they applied a new physics engine to her clothing. What's the big deal here? Well, the thing is, it's not just her appearance that's changed. In this one scene alone, Bo Peep demonstrates more initiative, gumption, and leadership in a matter of seconds than was ever shown in the first two movies. Commanding the other toys around Molly's room with the same caliber that Woody did mere moments ago in Andy's room. And to put it simply, this is not the Bo Peep that we knew. They're not even kind of comparable. They may wear the same clothing, although as we just established, technically that's not even true, but they are not the same person. Person. Bo Peep from the first two movies was always the one that got left behind in the room while the other toys went off and had their adventures. The most we ever saw her do was relay the fact that Buzz was still alive and then tell the Incredible Hulk here to lower the ramp. Beyond that, her character essentially just boiled down to being Woody's love interest, so to see her act the way she does here isn't just jarring, it's straight up inconsistent. And just so we are perfectly clear about this, there is absolutely nothing wrong on a conceptual level with making Bo Peep into a more headstrong character. Because to be frank, with the exception of this one scene from the first movie, if you cut her out of the Toy Story series entirely, you really wouldn't have missed anything prior to Toy Story 4 because she has no impact on anything major and isn't even present in Toy Story 3. The idea of taking a character from the original trilogy who received zero development and whose role amounted to nothing more than be Woody's love interest is a fantastic premise. And since the story of this movie is going to be about reuniting with Bo Peep years after she left her original family of toys and having been on her own for so long, it makes perfect sense for her to demonstrate more resourcefulness when it's just her against the universe. And so that evolution of her character follows logically, conceptually. But it doesn't make any sense for her to be demonstrating that same personality here because it is directly contradicted to her behavior in the first two movies. It would have made far more sense if she had been more in line with how 
she was originally, and then later in the movie when we see her again after years of being a lost toy, we can see how much she's grown and changed having to adapt her surroundings. So then, you may be asking yourself, why did they go out of their way to change so much about her in the prologue of this movie when we have evidence clearly highlighting the contradictory behavior? And the answer is a little something called gaslighting. For those of you who don't know, gaslighting is a form of psychological manipulation most often highlighted in abusive relationships where someone attempts to get you to question your memory and beliefs. It's a lot more complex and layered than I could possibly cover right now, so if you want to learn more about the topic, I've linked some articles in the description that go into far more detail than I'll touch on here. But the basic premise is simple enough for our analysis today. Being deliberately or unintentionally manipulative by causing someone to doubt their own perceptions and memories. And that is exactly what's being done here. We have unfalsifiable receipts proving definitively that Bo Peep is acting completely incongruent with how she's been previously established and that her outfit has been radically changed. But they show you this character with the same general appearance in a location we're familiar with her being in during a time period when the earliest moments in the series are set because the writers are trying to gaslight you into believing that Bo Peep was always like this. They're afraid that people won't buy into the shift in her personality by default, and the action scenes that they want to take place will never work if Bo Peep has to waddle around like she did previously, so they have to rewrite the history of the material material and physics of her dress. But since they can't just straight up rewrite history, they did the next best thing and wrote a scene taking place in the time between Toy Story 2 and 3 and having her act the way that they ultimately want her to so that they can gaslight you into doubting your memory of the original movies. They want you to think, was she really always like this? I mean, it has been two decades since I've seen the originals. Ugh. Maybe my memory is really starting to slip. It's downright deceptive and manipulative and a desperate attempt to get the rest of their story to function as they hope and pray that their audience's memory is so pathetic that they won't question it and just move right along with the rest of the film. But hey, don't take my word for it. Take theirs. Yeah, and Bo didn't have a lot of screen time in the earlier films. We didn't even see her at all in three. So we knew it was important to set up who she is, what she looks like. The very two things that are undeniably different from her presence in the first two movies. How very interesting. Okay, back to the plot. RC's about to commit the big die and the toys need to save him. So what ingenious point are they going to implement to save the day? I'm not sure. Let's find out. The first step is to order the sheep, whose names are apparently Billy, Goat, and Gruff, despite this somehow having never come up at all prior to this point, to raise the blinds. Question. Why? Why did you need the sheep to raise the blinds? The core's literally right there. Why can't you just raise it yourself? They have no. You never told me that. You never asked. Oh, get out of here with this nonsense. No way in the world Woody would not know the name of Bo Peep's sheep. How could that information have never come up at all? Like, I don't know, maybe when she needed to command her sheep to stop wrestling with Rex's controller? All she had to do was whistle to get them to back off, but that seemed like a pretty good time for her to call out their names. No way you show Woody and Bo pulling off this intricate plan with perfect execution and teamwork while simultaneously trying to get me to believe that he doesn't know the name of her sheep. No way Bo never called out their names at any point in the past decade that she was in this house with the other toys. No way you have a shot literally seconds after this where Woody and and Bo's minds are so in sync that they both simultaneously say Operation Pool Toy! Meaning that these two not only have a catalog of operations already thought out ahead of time for a variety of situations should a toy ever be in trouble, but that they were able to both immediately and simultaneously come to the conclusion of Operation Pool Toy! And yet Woody doesn't know the name of her sheep. Gee, it's almost as if they never had names prior to this point and the writers just invented them to make Woody seem like he doesn't care about them later on in this movie or something stupid like that. So then Operation Pole Toy begins proper as Slinky enlists for duty and then Bo turns to the Barbie dolls and gets them in a position for what I can only describe as the most pointless Rube Goldberg machine in history. I'm gonna run you through the logistics of how this all goes down and then we'll sit down and have a chat about it. First, the Barbie dolls perform gymnastics to get on top of the dresser. Then, Ness picks up an armadillo as the descending divas pass a book entitled The Very Unique Unicorn over their heads and onto the shelf. Ness tosses the armadillo into position directly underneath the book, serving as a fulcrum for a newly formed seesaw. <sighs> Jesse stands on one side as the load, and then the three Barbies jump in perfect unison onto the opposite side as the effort force, thus successfully launching Jesse up to the latch on the window, allowing the other toys to open it up fully. Now, this sequence looks pretty cool when you watch it for the first time, but then you actually think about it for five seconds and you realize that it's all completely pointless. The end objective of this plan is to open up the window so the toys can get outside and rescue RC without the humans seeing them. So why don't you just stack Jesse on top of Buzz and then unlock lock the window. They planned to do that exact thing in Toy Story of Terror when they were all stuck in the glass cabinet. Jesse was going to rescue Woody so the two of them could stack on top of each other and turn the handle to free the toys. It is the easiest solution to this problem that could be achieved within seconds, but for some stupid reason, you have to get literally every single toy in this room involved in this insane plan to open the window? Why? Why have you devised such a convoluted plan when there are infinitely easier options available to you? You realize this is a joke, right? Like an actual joke that other shows use to make you laugh? There must be some trick to opening this case. A latch or somebody to twist it or... Or we could hit it with a rock. 
Yeah, that works. Seriously, what was the point of any of this? All you had to do was just form a toy ladder and unlock the latch. We see you do that exact thing later in this movie. Every second counts when RC is fighting to stay alive. Why are you choosing the most complicated way to do things? And wait a minute, Molly has three Barbie dolls in this movie, but by the time we get to Toy Story 3, we're down to just one. So when Molly shifted into angsty teen mode when she was too old for toys anymore, she apparently decided that having three Barbies was no longer cool, but just one Barbie? Now that's classy. Seriously, you expect me to believe that the angsty teen who's too cool for toys took the time to only donate or throw away two Barbies, but not this one? Previously, we were left to assume that Molly simply forgot about her because she was tucked away behind a xylophone. But now, thanks to this stupid movie, we know that she had to consciously choose to only get rid of two Barbies, but still hold on to one of them, which is absurd. Thanks, Toy Story 4. We're only two minutes into this movie, and you've already punched a hole in Toy Story 3. Awesome. I certainly hope this doesn't become a pattern throughout the rest of this film. <sighs> whatever. The window is now open, and it's time to jump right into the action and rescue RC, since he is literally struggling for survival in every second count. Nope, Woody and Bo are gonna take a solid six seconds to just stare into each other's eyes. I, I don't- I- what the- what, what are you doing? RC is about to be swept away and lost to the storm forever! What are you doing right now? Why are you just sitting around twiddling your thumbs? Every second counts while he is still out there in the storm. Why are Buzz and Jesse not yelling at Woody to get off his ragdoll rear end and do something? What is happening in this scene? Does anybody actually care about RC? Or do you just want to take the extra second to show off the rain dripping from the freshly opened window to flex your graphical fidelity some more? Gee, I sure hope these precious seconds don't make things way harder for you than they otherwise would have been. So then Woody finally jumps out the window and... Huh. Would you look at that? The same music that played during the climax of Toy Story 2. Two. Nah, nah, I'm sure it's nothing. I'll, I'll with the film. The plot is what matters, and I gotta be honest, it's doing great so far. I mean, just look at this gorgeous rain as it collides against the driveway. Wait, 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 driveway? There's a driveway on the left side of the house? Why is there a driveway on the left side of the house? This did not exist in the original movies. This could not be more blatantly obvious. How did you think you were gonna get away with this? What, are you gonna try to tell me that they built a new driveway after Toy Story 2? Yeah, that'd be great if there weren't clear shots in Toy Story 3 that demonstrated quite explicitly that this driveway didn't even exist when Andy was 17 years old old, meaning that the only way this makes any sense at all is if they paved this driveway between movies and then scraped it up before Toy Story 3 happened. Despite the fact that during the time period this flashback takes place in, this family only has one car and that would be kept in the garage since Andy still isn't old enough to drive at this point, and it makes no sense to take away extra space before you add a second car to your arsenal. Or in other words, the excuse that they may have built a new driveway between films doesn't work. Are you telling me you forgot the geography of Andy's house? You forgot the basic geography of Andy's house? How did that happen? This is all digital. It's all 3D models stored on your computer. Just go back and look at the old movies. Look at your old scene files. How do you screw up this badly? Or are you telling me that you are actually fully cognizant of the geographical discrepancy and you just try to gaslight the audience again by tricking them into believing this driver was always here? Sure it would be awkward if that were the case, but whether the writers are stupid or malicious with their intentions here, this contradiction is still a problem either way. You're welcome to take your pick. So Bo Peep grabs Slinky's butt and what he holds onto his head as the two work together to try to save RC before he's swept away forever, but even by stretching Slinky out as far as he can go and by extending Woody's reach by cleverly pulling out a string for Slink to grab onto, RC is just barely out of reach, meaning his fate has been sealed and he's about to be swept away into the storm drain and lost to Pennywise forever. Yeah, it's almost like you shouldn't have been wasting time by wobbling around like a confused penguin and choosing the slowest possible plans for accomplishing your task and staring into Bo's eyes like a starving puppy dog while your friend was being swept away to his death! Wait a minute, why did Buzz even need to be here? Why did Woody bother bringing him along? He hasn't done anything since they got to Molly's room except ask, How do we reach? He's just standing there like a useless cabbage. Jesse's holding the flashlight and Bo's holding on to Slinky, but Buzz isn't doing squat. Wait, how did Woody even know to call Slinky to Molly's room if he didn't decide on Operation Poultry until well after he got there? Sure, it's convenient that you brought him along, or else that would have been even more time that you wasted going back across the hall to get Slinky. Oh, whatever, Arcee's gone anyway, what does it matter? But wait, it's not over yet, as just when Woody thinks all is lost, he suddenly sprung forward the exact distance he needed to be sprung in order to grab hold of RC, and it is revealed that's because Bo attached a, a, a chain of monkeys to Slinky? He's tail? What the? What? This just doesn't. How did you? What, what the? What? Alright, look, you might think it's insane to get this hung up over the chain of monkeys, but RC's survival literally depends on the functionality of this chain. If this chain of monkeys weren't used in this scene, he'd have been swept away and lost forever. It is imperative that this plan runs logically, and without any exaggeration, there are approximately five different reasons why this whole scene is just falling apart at the seams. It was already barely hanging on, but this just pushed it over the edge. So let's take each problem one by one. First of all, there is absolutely no way that they could have possibly assembled the monkeys in time. Aside from the fact that we don't see the barrel of the monkeys would have 
had to come out of anywhere in the room when they first enter it. And aside from the fact that we don't even see the barrel anywhere near the dresser after Operation Pool Toy is successfully completed, the barrel of monkeys was always Andy's toy. He was always the one who actually played with them, meaning that the barrel would be in Andy's room. Meaning that what would have had to occur in the literal three seconds between Bo gasping in fear and Woody springing forward is that one of the toys ran all the way back across the hall, dug around Andy's room to find the barrel of monkeys, and then ran all the way back to Molly's room just to assemble the chain. There's no way that could have possibly happened. This movie is full of baloney. Second, even if we assume that this is a different barrel of monkeys or that Andy got bored of playing with them and gave them to Molly, heck, even if we give him maximum benefit of the doubt and assume that the barrel was somehow close enough to them, despite being nowhere in this shot, that they were able to almost immediately summon it to their position and pour all the monkeys out of the barrel, they still only had three seconds to assemble approximately 30 monkeys into a chain. If you don't think this is utterly ridiculous, then by all means, prove me wrong. Go get a barrel of monkeys, dump them out onto the floor, and see if you can assemble 30 of them into a chain in three seconds all by yourself. Let me save you the trouble. You can't. You can't do that. There's no way. The clock will have run out before you can even assemble a third of these things. And if you can assemble this chain in that amount of time, then you might want to contact the Avengers. I hear they've recently had a position become available for the Quicksilver replacement. And before you try to tell me that there could have been more than one person assembling the chain, look at who's available to help in this scene. Jesse is holding the flashlight on Woody, and since the light never flickers, we know she couldn't have been helping to assemble it. Bo also could not have been helping since if she stops fondling Slinky's butt for even a single second, the plane is ruined and all three toys are lost to the storm forever. The armadillo wasn't going to do diddly squat given its anatomy. The sheep are stuck on the floor. Ness is over on the bed. And if the Barbies had helped assemble the chain, then they would be up on the dresser with everyone else since they would have had to be right next to Slinky to help attach it when they finished. Meaning the only toy here that would be even remotely capable of stringing this together would be Buzz. But in spite of how competent and capable he has been throughout the original trilogy, he's not Dash. He can't do a Guido pit stop and assemble this thing in three seconds. This movie is full of baloney. Third, even if we give the very, very generous assumption that the monkeys psionically knew that their presence in the scene would single-handedly save Arcee's life and self-assemble themselves into a chain so that all Buzz would have had to do was attach it to Slinky, how would they have ever had the room to do this? Hooking the last monkey in the chain would be easy enough because you just have to get it over the top of this dresser while the rest of them could dangle down ready to be flung out the window. But Bo's crook is hooked onto the very back of the chain, meaning that she somehow made made her way all the way to the back of the chain to grab hold of it. But again, she can't lose hold of Slinky or else the plan fails. And there isn't enough room on this desk for this extensive chain to fit, especially since these things don't wrap around each other very neatly, meaning you couldn't coil them around on the desk without risking breaking the chain or getting them all tangled up. So there is absolutely no way they had enough room to make the switch. This movie is full of baloney. Fourth, even if we assume that they figured out some magic way to fit this thing on the desk without breaking the chain, how the hell did Bo have enough strength to hold onto this chain. The film makes this seem like an incredibly fluid transition, but really think about the implications here. Think about what would have had to occur for this stunt to work. Slinky Dog is a spring toy. When you extend a slinky, mechanical energy is stored up within the coil due to the resistance against the force of you pulling apart the coils. And when you let go of the slinky, what happens again? <laughs> Oh yeah, it goes flying in the opposite direction because the mechanical energy that you just stored up is now released from the spring, and it snaps back to its compressed state. Now, with all that in mind, think about it in the context of this scene. In order to create this extension, Bo has to attach the monkeys, hook her crook onto the last monkey in the chain, and then push Slinky's rear end out the window so Woody can get the extra reach he needs in order to grab onto RC, since Slinky wouldn't know that he has to move his butt forward when his head is all the way out here, and he can't communicate with the people in the window. Slinky is being stretched out as far as he can possibly go without any extra forces at play. And do you remember what happened the last time we were in a situation like this? I can't hold on much longer. Slink, hang on! The instant Bo lets go of Slinky and nudges him out the window, the mechanical energy that was stored in his coils is going to be instantly released as his rear end races to reunite with his front. Bo's flimsy little stick would have been ripped right out of her hands and been sent flying across the yard if she's lucky. Worst case scenario is her whole body is yanked out the window and she falls to her death and is smashed into a million tiny pieces. Since she is an incredibly fragile porcelain doll, this movie is full of baloney. Fifth, even if we throw 
any and all logic completely out the window and assume that Bo was actually strong enough to resist this spring and remain firmly planted in the windowsill, Woody should have been flung way further than he actually was. We don't exactly have the means to measure the exact distance between these two points, but if you were going to tell me with a straight face that this distance is in any way equivalent to this distance, then please excuse me while I cackle uncontrollably. Woody should have been whipped right past Arcee and into the flower bed. Or in other words, this movie is completely full of baloney! But believe it or not, we're not done with the stupidity just yet, because now that Woody has safely secured RC, he needs to get him back into the house. How is he going to accomplish that task, you may ask? Well, he doesn't have much time to think because a surprise car pulls up to the house out of nowhere. And so, Bo pulls back the chain of monkeys causing Woody and RC to crash against the side of the house and- Wait, 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 what?! How? How did you do that? Did you inject steroids into your porcelain veins between Toy Story 2 and now? How are you this strong? How are you able to pull Slinky, Woody, the entire chain of monkeys, and the single heaviest toy Andy owns all the way back towards the house? Even if you are somehow strong enough to yank a motorized vehicle towards you, how did you mechanically pull this off without sending yourself flying backwards off the shelf and plummeting to your death? Even if you do have the strength to pull this off, that means you pulled back so hard that the monkeys would have to be sent flying back into Molly's room. And since the doorway is directly behind you, I wouldn't be surprised if even some of them made it into the hallway. The film wants you to think the monkeys just disappeared into thin air after Bull pulled the chain backwards, but that's not how anything works. The monkeys must have fallen behind behind her when she pulled everyone out of the driveway, so how in the world did nobody hear them clattering against the floor? If it were just one monkey, that'd be one thing, but there's about 30 of these things linked in this chain. If you dumped out a barrel of 30 monkeys onto a tiled floor, you can bet that it's going to make a very loud noise that there's no way at least one person at the dinner table downstairs wouldn't hear, or at the very least, they definitely see the monkeys scattered all over the place in the very next scene when they walk into the room. Unless, of course, they just teleported out of the scene. Where did they go? Where are all the monkeys? Where did their barrel go? Go. Wait, wait, wait a minute, you pulled the chain back far enough to lose all the monkeys, but just short enough so that Slinky's butt would land exactly on the window so where it was previously? What the f- WHAT?! What is happening right now? What is this scene?! None of this makes any sense! Who wrote this?! But nonetheless, the worst of it is finally over. RC has been successfully retrieved, and so now all the toys have to do is pull up Slinky's coral and get everyone back inside the house. Wait, how the heck did Woody get RC back inside when he was holding onto him from a- Above. Do you people understand how heavy this toy is? Oh, whatever, it's fine, so whatever. Okay, well, Operation Pull Toy's over. Let's just get back inside the house and hope this movie's plot can return to a sense of normalcy. Beautiful. I'm so glad. Uh, can, can I get, like, a one minute break? We're only three minutes into this stupid movie and there's barely been a single second that there wasn't broken in some capacity. Okay, so while Bo was giving Woody the fork boy eyes, this joke will make sense later, I promise, Annie's mom waddled into the room with a visitor who showed up unexpectedly during Operation Pull Toy and turns on the light switch, promptly shutting the window on Woody moments later. How did Andy's mom not see Bo peering her head out the window when she turned the light on? How did she not see Buzz or Jesse standing next to her? Why were none of the toys keeping watch in case someone stuck up on them like this? How didn't they hear Andy's mom or the visitor walking up the steps? How did they not notice their presence until this very moment? Did they not talk to each other at all until they actually got to Molly's room? And if you are going to try to tell me, oh, well, the window was open, so the footsteps would have been drawn out by the rain, so I'm outside, then I will simply invert the audio problem, and this time we'll try it from the other end. If you believe that the rainstorm would have been so loud outside that they would not have been able to hear the humans walking upstairs, then why in the world did nobody notice the sudden change in audio levels when the toys open the window and go upstairs from the dinner table to see what was going on? Either the storm is loud enough to mask the sound of human footsteps, meaning the family should have noticed something was wrong and got upstairs to shut it earlier, or it's quiet enough for them not to notice, meaning that the toys should have been able to hear the footsteps. This doesn't work, no matter how you slice it. Actually, wait a minute, how doesn't Andy's mom find it at all odd that the windows open anyway? She just walks into the room and casually shuts the window as if it's a totally normal occurrence, but this doesn't make any sense. Molly literally isn't tall enough to reach this window, and even if she was, or she used something else as a stepping stool to reach it, what motivation does she think Molly would have even had to open it in the first place? Molly's right there! Why didn't you ask why the window was open during a rainstorm? If I were her and I walked into my daughter's room and saw the window wide open in this ravenous storm, the first thing I'd ask is, why in the world is your window open? And then when she tells me that she didn't open it up, it would prompt some curiosity as to how exactly it got opened, which leads me to my next point. Andy Andy's mom closes the window on Slinky's coil. Half of his body is still dangling outside in the storm while his rear end just sits on the windowsill and she acts as if this is totally normal? How does she not see his butt? How did she not feel compelled to glance outside the window to see what was 
was going on with this other half. How does this window even close properly at all when there would still be a part of Slinky's coil preventing it from shutting all the way? My point here is that there are way too many problems with this window situation for her to not stop and wonder what in the world is happening in this room. And the fact that the toys weren't caught when Bo was fully alive and moving around in full view of the doorway is absolutely absurd. Who wrote this silly string script? Moving on, it turns out that the visitor is only briefly stopping by to pick up Bo Peep as Molly says that she doesn't need it anymore and wishes to donate it to this man. Question, why did they schedule this lamp donation meeting for dinner time? Andy's mom must know when the family's gonna eat dinner. Why would she schedule it so close to this time? Was there no better point in the day for her to do this? And if they're already finished eating, then good lord, that was the fastest meal in the West. Also, his mom only grabs Bo Peep and the lamp, but not the sheep which are presumably still down on the floor, and walks off without them, and yet they still show up in the box moments later. Awesome. I, I guess the sheep can teleport now. It's, why not? So after everyone leaves, Buzz pulls the rest of Slinky back up into the room, and then notices that Woody's mysteriously not holding on to Slinky anymore. Yet despite the fact that Slinky would obviously know where Woody went, since he would have had to drop past his head to leave, he chooses not to tell Buzz this, and instead looks around with concern, along with the others, like a confused pigeon. But, it's whatever, I guess. The man takes the box back to his car, but then makes the unfortunate discovery that he can't put it in his trunk because because he doesn't have his keys? What? How? How did you lose your keys? You were in that house for two minutes at most, and even that is a very generous assumption to make when it took less than a minute of screen time for you to leave your car, get the box, and then return to your car. Why did you take your keys out of your pockets for a visit that took no more than a minute or two? How did you lose your keys? And before you say, maybe they fell out to that, I say no. His first instinct when trying to get his keys is to reach for his pockets, meaning that that is where they would ordinarily be, and keys do not fall out of these pockets unless there's a hole in them, so he would have had to voluntarily take them out of his pocket and leave them on a table somewhere in the house, and the kids and their mom would have either had to be cunning enough or inattentive enough to not tell the man about the keys he left on their table, neither of which would be within their personalities that were established in the original movies. And if you think it's ridiculous for me to be spending this much time talking about this, then I cannot understate enough that him losing his keys is what allows this box scene to happen. A scene that is absolutely critical for this story is only able to occur due to the insane idea that this man lost his keys out of his jean pocket after being in a house for two minutes or less. Who wrote this? Anyway, Woody stealthily pulls the box underneath the car and opens it up, urging Bo Peep to follow him back inside before the keyless wonder comes back to take her away, but to his absolute bewilderment and the utter shock of the audience, Bo says nah. Woody is understandably gobsmacked by this turn of events and attempts to appeal to the fact that her staying is what would be best for Andy, but she responds by saying... I'm not Andy's toy. Which is a very strange thing to say, considering how often we've seen Andy play with her in the past. So whether she technically belongs to Molly or Andy doesn't really matter at all. But even if this weren't the case, even if we say that Andy never played with her at all, the next words out of her mouth are even more baffling. It's time for the next kid. What? It's time for the next kid? Really? You're perfectly willing to just leave, just like that? You don't even want to say goodbye to your friends? You don't care about them at all? Buzz? Jesse? The other toys in Molly's room who appear to at least have some level of respect for you since you were able to effortlessly command them as their leader? Nobody? You just decided that the day you got put in a box was the day you were going to proceed to stop giving a slinkies behind about your friends? And if you want to say, well, she only really cared about Woody, which obviously isn't true based on what happens later in this film, so it makes total sense that she only wanted to say goodbye to him. The only reason she had this goodbye scene with Woody is because Woody dropped down to desperately try to get her to stay. Had he been pulled back up into the room, Bo would have been perfectly content to leave Andy's house forever without even so much as saying goodbye to the friend she spent her entire life with him until this point. Also, I think it's worth noting that I find the director's commentary for this scene very interesting. I had to make sure that every single moment, every single blink, every single inhale was for a reason. It was all reading kind of across from one shot to the next. Yeah, so in this scene, we got Tom Hanks and Annie Potts together, and we actually recorded them in a recording studio at the same time, facing each other and delivering these lines, having them experience those conversations and that kind of breakup in the room together and work through it would be more effective. All they're talking about is the work that went into the voice acting and visual presentation of this scene. In fact, now that I think about it, they actually had a similar diatribe about this stuff earlier. Yeah, the effects department worked really close with the lighting department on the look of this rain. They wanted to exaggerate the shape of the drops and to really kind of feel the scale of this rain for a toy. Hmm, it's all focused on the visual splendor. Interesting. I wonder if I'm highlighting this for a wider point that I'm going to be making later. Well, if I am, then you might want to remember this just in case. But we're going to have to table this discussion for a while because something of monumental stupidity is about to occur. <sighs> so Bo tempts Woody, not a great way to start the sentence, but whatever, by saying that... You know. 
kids lose their toys every day. Sometimes they get left in the yard or put in the wrong box. Meaning that she wants Woody to come with her and her sheep take a few steps back to further drive that idea into your heads because apparently the writers didn't think the audience would pick up on what they were insinuating by Bo's word choice alone. Then, and I kid you not, Woody puts his hands on the box and starts to climb in with Bo. He wants to leave Andy's house with Bo Peep. What? What do you mean he wants to leave Andy's house with Bo freaking Peep? I am not lying to you right now. This actually happens in the movie. What he considers abandoning his friends and his kid to be with Bo Peep. Absolutely not. Buzz off, you stupid movie. I, I, I don't even know where to begin with this one. Okay, let's start with the other toys. Do you remember this scene from the end of Toy Story 2? When it all ends, I'll have old Buzz Lightyear to keep me company. For infinity and beyond. Yeah, well, apparently that meant approximately diddly do because he was about to abandon Buzz, Jesse, Slink, Rex, Ham, the Potato Heads, Bullseye, and just one more time for good measure, Buzz Lightyear. He was gonna leave his best friend, the Space Ranger he promised to be with for infinity and beyond, all because Woody finally lived up to his namesake when he saw Bo make room for him to come inside. Get out of here with that garbage, you absolute hack writers. But that's not even mentioning the fact that Woody was about to abandon Andy, his favorite toy, his cowboy doll, the only only toy in his collection that he instinctively hesitated to give away to Bonnie at the end of Toy Story 3. Woody was gonna leave him behind. And to be perfectly blunt, there is no timeline where Woody would have ever ever in a million years chosen to leave Andy for literally any reason. The reason he was willing to go with Bonnie at the end of Toy Story 3, since remember Andy's plan was to bring him to college, but it was ultimately Woody who snuck inside the box with all the other toys. Woody accepted that Andy was all grown up. He was going off to college and was about to start a whole new life and gain a whole lot of new responsibilities. Woody would have been better served in the care of Bonnie, a girl who expressed the same ebullient joy that he used to see on Andy's face all those years ago, and so he made the hard choice to say so long, partner, to the kid he spent 17 years with and watched him grow into the man he became, ready to bring new memories to a kid who needed him even more. But even then, even then, the one who made the final choice to pass on Woody was Andy. If Andy had chosen to keep Woody with him in college, then he would have gone with him. But the final decision that lands Woody in the care of Bonnie is Andy's. He was passed on with Andy's blessing for Bonnie to take care of. And that is the reason why Woody went with Bonnie at the end of Toy Story 3. Because Andy chose to let Woody go at the same time Woody chose to let Andy go. But at this stage in his life, at a time when Andy is still getting an immeasurable amount of joy playing with Woody, at a time when Andy still needs him to be there for him, at a time that takes place after the events of Toy Story 2, which was a movie that was all about Woody realizing that no matter how tempting an alternative may seem, life's only worth living if you're being loved by a kid, and that... I can't stop Andy from growing up, but I wouldn't miss it for the world. There is no chance in the world he would have ever gone into that box with Bo Peep. And if you are screaming at me that, but Woody still stays with Andy at the end of the day, he doesn't actually go with Bo Peep, then you did not pay attention to this scene. The only reason Woody stays is because he sees Andy running out, desperately calling his name looking for him. Had Andy not chosen to run out at this exact moment in time, Woody would have abandoned his friends and his kid. Buzz off, you stupid writers. Who wrote that? What bird brain did you put in charge of? this scene. Also, why was Andy even running out of this time? Should he not have been at the dinner table? There's absolutely no way they finished dinner in less than three minutes, so there's no way Andy would have run back upstairs to play with his toys in the less than 60 seconds it took his mom and sister to handle the lamp transaction. Not only does that not make any sense, if he was gonna do that, then he would have done it as soon as they went up the stairs, meaning we would have seen him running across the hall here, and he should have noticed that Woody was gone a lot sooner. And did he not notice that Buzz and Jesse are also not in his bedroom? Also, also, can we talk about the implications of Woody's plan here? Because this doesn't make any sense. I know, big shocker for this movie. What was Woody's plan? Just get in the box without saying goodbye to his friends? Because in that situation, if you are any of these toys, the first thing you're gonna think, given the circumstances, is, oh no, Woody was lost in the storm when he dropped off Slinky. Quick, we have to organize a rescue mission to go find him. You know, that thing that they did in Toy Story 2? His friends may have spent the rest of their lives going on a rescue mission for Woody that will never reach a resolution. Also, 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 this was a stupid plan just in terms of its functionality in the first place. This dude isn't Al McWiggins. Yes, that is his actual last name. 
game. He's just your average guy living his life. Once he got home, opened up the box, and realized that Woody was in there, he would have just returned him to Annie's house afterwards, and then Woody would have gotten back to the room looking like the biggest jerk on the planet for abandoning all his friends, not thinking about the implications of doing so for five seconds. And how do I know this man would have returned Woody? Well, outside of the baseline assumption that most human beings are actually quite nice, I have references. Even though the transaction had already been set in motion and agreed upon ahead of time, he still took the time to make doubly sure that Molly would have been fine with donating this lamp. So if he found a toy with Andy's name written on it that he never received permission to take, he would have immediately returned it to their house. This plan is not only completely at odds with Woody's character as established by the original trilogy, but it is fundamentally broken from a perspective of basic logic in that it would have never worked in the first place. So let me ask again, who wrote this? But whatever, Woody comes to his senses and realizes that he would never, ever, ever in a million years for any reason at all voluntarily choose to abandon his kid as well as his friends. He had a momentary blip of stupidity, but it's all fine now. His character is still intact and it's not in danger of being assassinated by anything else that's gonna happen later in this movie. All is well. And so he says goodbye to both people, Andy is desperately running around the yard trying to find him and the visitor takes Bo away and then drives off. Wait, where did Andy go? He ran at the door into the yard seconds ago and now he's completely disappeared from the scene only to magically reappear seconds later to retrieve what he just- what the- We've only been through five minutes of this movie, and we're already almost 40 minutes into the video. That is how much is broken already. And with that, the prologue is complete, and good lord almighty, what an absolute train wreck. But hey, it was just the opening scene. Maybe things just got out to a rocky start. Let let's, let's try to enjoy the rest of the movie, shall we? We pan up into the rain clouds, emerging into a bright blue sky with clouds that bear a striking resemblance to... Wait a minute. You got a friend in me. Reach for the sky. You huh. Would you look at that? The iconic, you've got a friend in me. Again, with Woody wiping away to reveal the logo against a bright blue background. Again. How very interesting. When did that nostalgic feeling of going back to the original Toy Story films? And the only way you can do that is with Randy Newman's song. Once we put You've Got a Friend of Me up against the visuals, it brought you right back. Same here with this wipe. That's the same way that we wipe on the title of Toy Story in the first film. Gee, I wonder if I'm highlighting this for a wider point that I'm going to be making later. Nah, it's nothing. On with the film. So we watch a montage of Andy playing with Woody as we listen to iconic Randy Newman music in the background and- Oh my goodness! What, what, what is this? What is this abomination on my screen? Because it sure as hell ain't young Andy from the original trilogy, that's for damn sure. And before you tell me it's because technology is more advanced now, of course he's gonna look different as character models become more realistic over the years. Then alright, I'll humor you for a second. Let's take a look back at how the character model of Andy has evolved throughout the series. In 1995, modeling and animating fully 3D human characters wasn't something anyone would have dared to do, except Pixar. But while pulling off such a feat was groundbreaking at the time, their strength was clearly in animating non-human characters, as the fidelity of these humans has certainly not aged well in the slightest. Naturally, this led to a more updated character model in Toy Story 2, and then another update to the model in Toy Story 3 during the brief amount of time that young Andy is on screen. Technology, as well as Pixar's experience with animating humans, Humans had evolved quite significantly in the four years between Toy Story 1 and 2, and even more so in the 11 years since 2 and 3. And yet, in spite of their desires to update the models to account for ever-evolving technological capabilities, you can immediately look at all three of these models and recognize them as the same character. The hardest pill to swallow in regards to that assertion is undoubtedly the first movie due to the sheer lack of detail here, but there is still a clear and concentrated effort to make sure Andy is still instantly recognizable in spite of the upgrading details between each iteration of the character. No such effort was present in Toy Story 4. They want you to believe that these two humans are the same Andy. No, absolutely not. Don't even try. It was very clear that keeping the character design consistent was not at all a priority for the team working on this movie. Then again, maybe you could say that such a thing has never been a priority for them. We were a little freaked out at first because we weren't planning on building uh, a model of young Andy. And one that would work in our world. Right. Well, we, you know, we made a lot of technological and artistic advances in the 11 years since Toy Story 2. Now we can do humans pretty well, so the challenge on this movie was to make the humans look better, but not have them feel like they were from a completely different movie. A lot of people ask if we updated the models of the main characters in the movie, and we did, actually. But hopefully, you won't notice it at all. And we did a lot of things under the hood to make the animation easier for the animators, but it was very important to us that they not look different at all. Oh. Well, what do you know? It was something that they used to prioritize during the production process. How about that? Oh, are you wondering what that was? That was the Sin Explore commentary for Toy Story 3 with director Lee Unkrich and producer Darla K. Anderson. They may or may not also be popping up occasionally throughout this video for... 
reasons. I don't even understand how this possibly can get screwed up. Just take the character model that you absolutely still have on your files and drop him into the scene. That's it. How does this happen? How do you get Bonnie to look exactly like she did in Toy Story 3, but not Andy? All the other human character models, including Andy's mom, who is only on screen for a few seconds at most, look like higher quality versions of their former selves, and yet young Andy got shafted in the process somehow. I don't understand how you could possibly screw this up unless you deliberately wanted to change his character design, but this time I genuinely have no clue why you would ever want to do that, so let's just chalk this one up to sheer incompetence and move on with our lives. The montage continues with some admittedly impressive cinematography as cleverly placed transitions allow us to progress through Woody's history from being played with by Andy, to Buzz Lightyear and Jesse coming into the picture, to being lovingly passed on to Bonnie in one single continuous shot, concluding with a final camera angle focusing in on the underside of Woody's boot, showcasing that Bonnie has written her name on it, signifying the official passing of the torch from Andy to Bonnie. Wait, 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 what? Bonnie wrote her name on Woody's boot? When? When did that happen? In the period of time between the end of Toy Story 3 and the start of Toy Story 4, Woody, Buzz, and Jesse go on many different adventures under the care of Bonnie across a variety of short films and TV specials. And during those specials, you can very clearly see that Woody, Buzz, and Jesse all still have Andy's name written on the underside of their boots. I had always assumed the reason why Bonnie never painted over it with her name was because she wanted to respect that they had originally been Andy's toys that he passed on to her and never gave it a second thought. But now we know that that's a truckload of horse manure because Bonnie eventually does write her name on not just Woody's boot, but Buzz's as well. Why didn't you wait so long to paint over Andy's name? What's that? Because maybe she only recently started writing her name on the toys? Well, no. That's not true at all. Because we clearly see in Toy Story that time forgot that Trixie has Bonnie's name written on her, and in this same holiday special, we can see that Andy's toys still have Andy's name written on them. And if you are going to tell me that this minor detail doesn't affect anything in the story, then I'm going to tell you to hold on to that thought for now. Keep it very fresh in your brains to remember for later. Because for now, it's entirely fair to make the assumption that Josh Cooley simply didn't watch any of the shorts or TV specials prior to creating Toy Story 4. Except, oh wait, no it's not, because he had a voice acting role in both the Small Fry short and the Toy Story of Terror Halloween special, and showcases characters in this movie who were present in both the Halloween and Christmas specials, and is fully cognizant of them as evidenced by the director commentary. Fun fact, you just saw Woody hiding behind Bonnie's Battle Sores Lunchbox. That is a tribute to the TV special Toy Story that Time Forgot. But it is fine. It is, you know, maybe he didn't pay attention to the script when he recorded those lines and just poached characters from them without thinking about what they previously did. The thing is, whether he forgot the events of the Toy Story universe, which is pathetic if true because he's the man in charge of continuing said universe, or whether he deliberately chose to ignore them, it doesn't really matter. Because either way, for as insignificant as you may think this detail is for the moment, the fact that he has clearly chosen to pretend that those specials don't exist for the sake of having this shot is going to utterly sink the end of this movie. It's going to wreck it beyond repair. The fact that Bonnie consciously chose to keep Annie's name there until years after Toy Story 3, and until just before the events of Toy Story 4, is going to punch an enormous hole in the credibility of this film's ending. So please remember it for later. And thus ends the Randy Newman montage for Toy Story 4, and the movie is finally going to begin proper as we cut to a scene in which all of Bonnie's toys have been temporarily swept into the closet because Bonnie's mom hurriedly cleaned the room, absentmindedly shoving all the toys in there. We get a shot of all the toys getting anxious about being in the closet for a few minutes, which is extremely bizarre since they all spent years in a toy box never getting to play with what is whatever, moving on. Among the list of toys that are struggling with temporary closet life is Jessie, who is hyperventilating due to her claustrophobia. And so, naturally, being stuck in a tightly enclosed space is going to- WAIT, WHAT IS THE SWEET MOTHER OF ABRAHAM LINCOLN?! Jessie IS HYPERVENTILATING BECAUSE SHE'S IN THE CLOSET?! YOU JUST- I- OH MY GOD- HOW ON GOD'S GREEN EARTH CAN YOU CLAIM TO LOVE TOY STORY WITH ALL YOUR HEART AND THEN PULL SOMETHING STUPID LIKE THIS?! Okay. Before I get into why this scene is so beyond frustrating, let's set the scene for a broader issue in regards to characters, shall we? Woody, Buzz, and Jesse, the three heroes of the original trilogy. Their stories were the beating heart and soul of those movies. Their arcs carried the emotional spirit of the trilogy, and their endearing personalities and values are what made them appeal to millions of people all around the world. And Toy Story 4 is going to mercilessly assassinate all three of them. Not in a literal sense, mind you. When I say character assassination, I am referring to the process by which a writer takes a previously established character and makes them act in ways that are completely contradictory 
sacred to the values that they've upheld since their initial introduction, essentially betraying who they are as people with no justifiable buildup whatsoever. None of these characters are safe from this man's malice. We are going to be keeping a very close eye on the structural integrity of their characters as we move throughout this video to see if any of them can even maintain 1% of who they used to be by the end of this train wreck. But we are not to a good start here, folks, because Jesse has already been dealt a significant amount of damage by just this one shot alone. But why is this the case? Well, allow me to explain. From the first seconds that Jesse was introduced to the silver screen, she was highly energetic and raring for adventure. She has never, not once, ever shown any fear in the face of an adventure waiting to be had. She was always extremely spirited, sprightly and confident in her interactions with other people, and was more than willing to dive headfirst into an adventure. Please remember that for later. She revels in the confrontation with Woody, actively egging him on when he challenges her, looking, no, hoping for a fight. When Buster needs to get outside, Jesse immediately springs into action to help him out. She leads the charge to break everyone out of their cells at Sunnyside, trap Rogue Buzz, and safely escort everyone past the aggressive search beams onto the slide. She confidently stands up to both the Manic Prospector and Tyrannical Lotso when her back is pressed against the wall, and doesn't even hesitate to leap onto the dumpster when Woody is pulled in by Lotso. She is a strong, confident cowgirl who shows no fear in the face of danger, but even the bravest of adventurers aren't immune to their most crippling of phobias. And in Jesse's case, it's claustrophobia. Crippling, mentally destructive, claustrophobia that would completely paralyze her were she ever to find herself in a space that was even remotely enclosed. Because for many years, Woody was to Andy as Jesse was to Emily. A kid that loved her cowgirl doll with all her heart as they did everything together. Jesse couldn't possibly have been happier than when she was in the tender, loving care of this girl. But nothing built can last forever as one day, as Emily started to grow up, she began to move past her cowgirl phase. She decorated her room with makeup supplies and memorabilia from pop musicians, slowly moving more and more memories of her childhood under the bed, destined to gather dust for all of eternity. And Jesse was left with no choice but to lie there, day after day, month after month, year after year, waiting for the day when Emily might remember her and come back for one last playtime, and for a moment, it looks like she's going to get her chance as, while trying to retrieve the items that spilled out of her purse, Emily reaches under the bed and finds something that she had forgotten about for years, Jessie the Cowgirl doll, the toy that gave her childhood so much joy, now staring eye to eye with the kid that gave her life purpose, and for one blissful moment, Jesse could relive those days they spent together, dreaming of the future memories they could make, only to be casually tossed into a donation pile without a second thought, leaving Jesse behind once and for all, giving her no choice but to sit in this cramped box and watch her whole world disappear over the horizon, doomed to sit in this tiny space amidst a massive storage facility for the rest of her life, forever replaying in her mind the days when somebody loved her. This is what leads to her fear of enclosed spaces, and you can see it throughout all her scenes in the original trilogy. When Alice seconds away from coming back into the room, she only has to jump into a box filled with styrofoam for a few minutes at most before he leaves again, but even that prospect is too painful for her because it resurrects all those painful memories that had long since been pushed down to the pits of her mind and brings them all back up to the surface. The cowgirl who mere moments ago was raring for adventure has now been frozen with fear, and this is not something that can be conquered easily. In Toy Story 3, Jessie starts hyperventilating at the mere thought of Andy abandoning her in the same way that Emily did and actively says, I can't breathe! The second after the trash bag is sealed shut. She may have found a new home with Woody and Buzz as her friends and Andy as her owner, but no amount of familial relationships can so easily purge your trauma when you suffered in isolation, darkness, and claustrophobia for as many years as Jessie has done. And all this buildup is what makes Toy Story of Terror so incredibly powerful. At first, it starts off as just another a normal day in Jessie's life, confidently declaring that this campy horror film the other toys are freaking out over doesn't phase her in the slightest, only to then be trapped in a tiny toolbox moments later as the walls start closing in on her. She is still, decades later, having to suffer through her phobias, even in spite of all the dangers she's fought her way past, as shown in this toolbox scene. And then again, minutes later, when she's left all alone in Bonnie's suitcase. It's destroying her. It's the one obstacle in her life that she's never been able to overcome as Emily, and the abandonment she caused Jessie to endure keep resurfacing whenever the walls start closing in, until the lives of her friends are at risk, until Ron successfully steals every last one of Bonnie's toys ready to sell them on eBay, until he seals Woody away in a package and ships him off to Al, and until the only one in a position to rescue him is Jessie. All her friends are trapped behind the glass. Bonnie is outside with her mom observing the flat tire be fixed. There's no one around to help save the day. It all comes down to her. 
She is Woody's only chance at getting back to Bonnie before he's shipped back to Al's toy barn. And the only way she can do it is to confront the only fear she's ever known. To seal herself in a box and sneak onto the delivery truck to break him out from the inside. But despite her bravery in facing her fears, she immediately slips back into the panic state she had become so familiar with. Hyperventilating as she feels the box grow smaller and smaller. But she knows she can't let her phobia corrupt her anymore. Not when everyone she loves and cares about is depending on her. Not when she's the only chance chance they have at escape. And so, finally, after two movies worth of build-up, she steadies her nerves even as she feels the walls closing in again. She regains her composure long enough to find something she can use to escape the box. And she slices the seal, triumphantly kicking open the flaps of her box, putting the clip in her mouth and donning her iconic cowgirl hat, ready to bust Woody out of this truck. She has finally overcome the one thing that was always holding her back, the only thing that could paralyze the adventurous cowgirl we all knew and loved and she stared it right in the face and told it to back off forever. It is phenomenal. It is the culmination of all her character work throughout this series, and it pays off in the best way imaginable, as now Jessie is no longer terrified of enclosed spaces like she once was. Only for Toy Story 4 to come rampaging into the picture and completely destroy all of that! Jessie's journey meant nothing now! It meant absolute squat! Her harrowing character arc that allowed her to finally confront her trauma head-on and kick it away forever has now been undone in a matter of seconds by this one shot! And as a gentle reminder, Josh Cooley voiced a character in the very same TV special when Jessie reached the climax of her character journey. And yet he still put this scene into the film. And to be frank, I don't really care whether he forgot this special or if he just maliciously chose to ignore it, because either way, the result is the same. Jesse's entire character arc was just crumpled up and thrown in the trash, and it was all done with absolutely no care in the world. Thanks, Josh Cooley, you talentless hack. But hey, at least Jesse's adventurous personality hasn't been destroyed yet. So, you know, we have that to look forward to. Right? Anyway, kicking on with the plot, Dolly asks Woody if she needs to be worried about the mental well-being of Andy's toys while they're stuck in the closet, which makes no sense at all. First of all, there's no way that in the year since Toy Story 3, this is the first time they've all been put in the closet, so this shouldn't be a new situation for Dolly to react to. Secondly, these toys spent years locked in a toy box without getting any playtime at all and managed to get through it completely unscathed, and yet now Rex and Slinky are acting like it's the end of the world? Wait, wait, what? So then Buzz asks Woody about how he's feeling today in the most awkward way imaginable, and I just... I uh, just listen to this dialogue. How are you uh, feeling about today? Uh, good, good, yeah, good. I'm good. Uh, good. I, I don't, what, who are you? What did you do with the Woody and Buzz we watched in the original trilogy? You two are not this emotionally constipated. Do you remember the scene from the first movie where the two of you had an emotionally harrowing heart-to-heart -heart about the importance of being a toy and how much meaning your lives really have? Or how about the one where Buzz confidently and assertively confronted Woody by calling back to that first major conversation they had at the gas station as Woody declares his intentions to stay behind? Or when the two of them discuss what's best for their family of toys as they contemplate whether to stay together or split apart? Or when they can speak a million words to each other without ever even opening their mouths? Do you know who these characters are? Did you actually watch these films? There is no way in the world you saw Woody and Buzz go through all their trials and tribulations and then came to the conclusion that this is how they'd speak to each other. Buzz off, you stupid movie. Anyway, while Doggy shakes his booty to let everyone know that Bonnie's finished breakfast because apparently he has supersonic hearing or something, I don't know, moving on. Woody then tries to give everyone a pep talk to get them excited for playtime, but Dolly tells him to stuff it because she's a complete... Well. The word I'm searching for, I can't say because there's preschool toys present. But I'll let you use your imagination. Apparently wanting everyone to get excited for playtime is a bad thing. I don't, I... <sighs> Bonnie opens the closet doors and assembles the Avengers consisting of Mayor Dolly, Banker Ham, Ice Cream Man, Slinky, Hat Shop Owner, Trixie, Mailman, Buzz, and... Wait a minute, that's not the face Buzz makes when he's frozen. <sighs> How hard is it to keep this stuff consistent? And for the final member of her Pokemon team, she picks up Woody, takes off his sheriff's badge, and then gives it to Jesse, leaving him behind in the closet. Which... Oh boy, where do I begin? First of all, that badge does not come off that easily. I had a Woody doll as a kid, I know, can you believe it? And trust me, this badge does not come off. It can come off, if you have the Jaws of Life on hand, but a five-year-old child is not ripping this carefully sewn badge off Woody's vest that easily. And if it is that easy to pull off, then it should have fallen right off his vest in many other far more harrowing situations throughout this series. Second of all, and far more importantly, seriously? Bonnie just pretends Woody doesn't exist? D do you remember this scene from Toy Story 3? Do you remember all these other shorts and specials? Did you pay any attention to this series at all? Bonnie is overjoyed to be playing with Woody in those scenes. 
happiness and actively slips out of her happiness when Andy pulls Woody away from her. Out of her entire arsenal, he is always one of the toys she brings with him outside of one quick trip to Poultry Palace and Small Fry. And yet, magically, now she's treating Woody like a pile of trash? Well, actually, she'd treat a pile of trash much nicer than this, so scratch that. This is absolutely insane. She never treated Woody like this in any of the prior installments in this franchise. Hell, even within this movie, we just saw a montage of Bonnie playing with Woody with the same enthusiasm that we once saw young Andy exude all those years ago. What motivation could you possibly have had for doing this? This idea just came from the truth, which is my daughter has a Jessie doll and she loves it. She also has a Woody doll, she doesn't play with it as much. We're just thinking, well, well, that would happen. Oh, I see. So you're just an idiot. Got it. You didn't write Bonnie based on, you know... Bonnie, you wrote her based on your own daughter. Hey, Bumble Clown, if you wanted to write a story with a young kid based on the attributes of your own daughter, that's great. In fact, I'd even say it's quite sweet. But write your own damn story if you want to do that. Don't infest a pre-established character with your own garbage storytelling and turn her into someone she never was just so your moronic plot can get off the ground. Oh, are you wondering what I mean by that? Well, you see, the main point of Woody's character in this movie is that he's feeling the big sad because Bonnie isn't playing with him as much as she used to. Hey, quick question. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Well, if it does, then please remember it for later. Later because I'm not done with this topic yet. Anyway, yeah, that's what he's plot in this movie, and it doesn't make any sense at all. That's the third time you haven't been picked this week. The third time this week? That's it? That's what you're still been out of shape over? That she hasn't been playing with you for a whopping three days? Three whole days? Compared against the montage we just watched of her playing with you over the years? Or the years between movies that we saw portrayed in short films and TV specials during which Bonnie happily played with you? But three out of seven days of the week of stasis and suddenly you think she's losing interest in you? What is this stupid script? Who wrote this? And again, I really, really hope you remember this for later because it is going to become monumentally important the further into this film we get. Oh, looky there, you got your first dust bunny. How? Literally how? How did you get a dust bunny? Don't try to tell me it's because Woody's been sitting in the closet all week because we learned earlier that the only reason everyone's in this closet is because... Everyone, listen, I thought I told you. When mom quickly cleans the bedroom like that, expect to be put in the closet. So Woody has been in here for a few minutes at best, and yet he somehow already accumulated a dust bunny? Meanwhile, all the other toys in the closet that have presumably been in here for years since we never saw them prior to this point don't even have a single dust bunny. Also, wait a minute, who are these guys even supposed to be? Apparently they're toys that Bonnie played with as a toddler but has since outgrown? What? If she outgrew these toys, then why in the world didn't she donate them to Sunnyside? You know, that daycare that her mom works at? What's especially stupid about this is that the peas in a pot in Totoro are nowhere to be seen in this movie. Which, aside from being insulting by itself, due to the significance that Totoro has to the studio. We decided really early on to put Totoro in the film as a nod to the friendship between Pixar and Studio Ghibli and the friendship between John Lasseter and Hayao Miyazaki. They love us, we love them, and uh, we thought it would be fun to have a Totoro toy. Almost like the director has a problem with Studio Ghibli or something crazy like that. Aside from that, this closet consists of every single toy Bonnie currently owns since their presence here is the aftermath of her mom cleaning out the room, meaning that Bonnie either donated or threw away those two toys who she was playing with in Toy Story 3, and yet the toys she played with as a toddler are just sitting in her closet? Why? Well, because if Bonnie donated them away, then we wouldn't get to hear such iconic voices as Carol Burnett, Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, and Betty White that I guarantee most of you didn't even know voice those characters until three seconds ago. This scene here, we got to work with some of the greats here. Mel Brooks, Carl Reiner, Betty White, and Carol Burnett as the uh, preschool toys. And the clock is an actor named Alan Oppenheimer, who voiced most of my childhood. You don't have to. It was such a privilege to work with these actors that are just, you know, made such Legends. a massive impression on us when we were younger, and to be able to have that chance to record them and have their voices be part of this film was really special for us. What's that? A stupid plot point that's allowed to function so the writer can fanboy out of our legendary voice actors? Prioritizing superficial stuff over storytelling? No, not Josh Cooley. Never. Wait a minute, why are you guys even talking anyway? Bonnie's literally right there! Sound can still travel through the blinders. You aren't soundproof in there. What are you doing? Ah, uh, moving on. Bonnie's dad comes into her room to tell her that they have to leave to go to kindergarten orientation. Yeah, he has a voice. Who knew? And she obviously doesn't want to go, so she pleads with her dad to be allowed to bring a toy with her to school, but he says nah because he's a jerk, and so they leave the room empty-handed. Then everyone wakes up since the humans have left their immediate vicinity, but Dolly has a yell at everyone because... Bonnie always forgets something. She'll be back any second. No, she doesn't. She's never done that. Throughout every single scene that Bonnie's ever been in, we have literally never seen her play with her toys, leave the room, and then immediately run back into the room seconds later because she forgot something. What are you talking about? Then Woody opens the closet doors and Buzz checks in to see if he's doing okay, at which point Jesse gives Woody back his sheriff's badge? What the... 
What- what is happening right now? If your concern is that you need to not touch or move anything because Bonnie will be back any second that she might notice that something is moved, which doesn't make any sense because she's a kindergartner, then why would you undo what Bonnie just did to Jesse? That's like the most suspicious thing you could do outside of sprinting down the stairs straight towards the other humans! What was even the point of Dolly ordering everyone to freeze again when everyone, including Dolly herself by the way, just completely ignores that order as if it meant nothing? Who wrote this dialogue? None of this makes any sense! Oh, by the way, speaking of Dolly, she's a total b I can't say. Do you guys remember Dolly from Toy Story 3? How she was very welcoming and friendly to Woody when he first showed up in Bonnie's room? How she was extremely considerate and willing to help Woody find out how to get back to Andy's house? Yeah, maybe she was a little too pushy in some instances. Uh, Woody. Woody, really? You're gonna stick with that. Well, Cause now's your chance to change it, new room and all. And that's, that's coming from a doll named Dolly. But she was still more than happy to help out Woody when he needed it, and her first instinct was to welcome him to the room with open arms. Now, cut to Toy Story 4, well all of a sudden... Woody, can't you see I'm threatening everyone? Go back to the closet. Yeah. What, what happened here? What did you do to Dolly? This is not the same character from Toy Story 3. She went from compassionate and accommodating to rude and condescending. Are you trying to make me hate all the old characters? Nah, that couldn't be. It couldn't be that you're trying to tear down all the old Old characters because we're about to meet some new ones that you want me to like more. Surely. And no, the context behind this conversation does not help things at all. It goes like this. Woody expresses genuine concern about how Bonnie is clearly visibly distraught about having to go to kindergarten for the first time, especially without having a toy that she can rely on for emotional support should she feel scared at any point. And Dolly's only recourse is to dismissively and aggressively shake her head as if Woody's idea is intrinsically awful without a second thought, and to then tell him that... Bonnie's not Andy. No. It did so? Did you not see how Bonnie acted most? Moments ago when her dad came into the room? He's not making this up because of some attachment issue, she's looking out for his kid! Your kid! What are you talking about? The closest you'll get to an actual decent rebuttal from her is when she says that Didn't you hear dad? You'll get Bonnie in trouble. Yeah. And even if we entertain for a moment that this rebuttal addresses Woody's concerns about Bonnie's happiness and mental state in any way, why are you so condescending to him about this? Can you not take the time out of your day to be respectful with him about this? What is this scene? Who wrote this dialogue? Let's see if our old friends can make sense of this. He keeps talking about Andy and keeps bringing Andy up and his history with Andy and his experience with Andy. This is going to be a tough transition for him. No, shut up! What are you talking about? He mentioned Andy a single time at the very end of this conversation. His initial concern was about keeping Bonnie happy because she clearly is very apprehensive about starting kindergarten. And even if we put that aside, you are insinuating that Woody using his experience with Andy to influence his decisions with Bonnie is a bad thing. Yeah, why would we want to encourage anyone to pull things that they've learned from their experiences as important factors in the decision-making process? How silly of a concept. Just get out of here with this crap. You aren't making any sense. We're setting up that Bonnie is going to be okay playing with Jesse. She's She's got her sheriff, and she will be okay without Woody. And we're going to see how that kind of plays out at the end of the film. You're right. We are going to see how this plays out. But it's going to happen a lot sooner than the end of the film, friends. So please keep this in mind for later. Oh, by the way, check out this little line. Uh, we kicked around some ideas, and what we came up with was the idea of Bonnie's toys as kind of an acting troupe. A bunch of actors uh, hanging out together and doing their thing. Like Mr. Pricklepants being the, the fussy British thespian. Buttercup, and, and also Trixie for that matter, being kind of the improv actors in the group. And uh, we just thought it would be a fun dynamic for these toys. Remember that dynamic from Toy Story 3? Yeah, that's just nowhere to be found in this film. The writers just completely forgot that that was how Bonnie's toys was supposed to be. But you know, keeping things consistent and honoring previous movies isn't exactly something they're particularly great at. Though, perhaps I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So Dolly shoves Woody back into the closet because Woody sucks, I guess, and then says... Places, everyone! And she says this literally seconds before Bonnie comes back into the room. How? How did you know she was coming? In the past, there was always some kind of audio indicator to let the toys know that the kids are about to come bursting into the room, but there was none whatsoever this time. Are you psychic now? And how lucky is it that Bonnie waited until the exact second you were done chastising Woody to come running back into her room. Also, wait a minute, Dolly told everyone to get to their places from in front of the closet despite this being nowhere near the spot that Bonnie left her, which is hysterical considering how much she chastised Ham earlier for moving less than an inch. That goes for you too, Ham. But it's funny. But what makes it even worse is that in the one whole second between saying that and Bonnie coming back in, she apparently teleported across the room back to her spot? Is anybody actually working in continuity in this film? I love just how parental these toys are with their kids. It's great that Dolly knows Bonnie so well that she's like, she's gonna forget something. She's gonna come back. She's, she's just ready. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? What do you mean she knows Bonnie so well? First of all, that thing about her running back into the room because she forgot something isn't true because she's never done that prior to this point, so 
I don't know where she's pulling this from. Second of all, it's not even true according to this movie standards because the reason Bonnie runs back into the room isn't because she forgot something, it's because she is literally terrified of going to kindergarten and is crying her eyes out. Not to mention the fact that Bonnie literally never does this again even a single time in any subsequent scenes that take place in Bonnie's room! You do not know what happened in your own script. Third, and most importantly, if Dolly actually knew Bonnie as well as you claim she does, then how embarrassing is it for her to not pay any attention to the fact that Bonnie is hiding in the corner crying because of how scared she is to go to a brand new school filled with people young and old that she's never met? Dolly doesn't know Bonnie well at all. In fact, that's since she's actually a complete failure at understanding what she needs right now. Oh yeah, I guess I kind of glossed over that, huh? Bonnie ran back into the room to have a cry about going to kindergarten, which Woody has a perfect view of and is understandably equally as distraught over because he doesn't like seeing people in this emotional state. He has the empathy needed to want to be there for Bonnie and help her get through this incredibly hard transitional period. Unlike a certain other doll. Then her parents come into the room to retrieve Bonnie and usher her out the door to get to kindergarten as if everything's totally normal. They don't make any kind of effort to support their crying daughter who's immensely apprehensive about kindergarten because they are terrible parents. How could you not have seen her crying? What did you think she was doing hunched over on the floor playing hide and seek? Do you not hear her sniffling in and fighting back more tears? I don't understand why they chose to have her parents proceed to not give one singular hoot about their terrified daughter when doing so would actually inherently apply a large patch to our next major issue, which is that Woody made the decision to hop into Bonnie's backpack to accompany her to kindergarten in case she needs a helping hand. Because while it's nice to see that his character is still intact here, as that is absolutely something Woody would do, how in the world did none of these three people notice him do this? Woody would have had to open the closet door, hop up onto the table, unzip the backpack, climb in, and then zip it shut from the inside without either parent noticing. It makes sense for Bonnie to not notice since her mind would be preoccupied with the butterflies in her stomach and her eyes are currently locked on the floor, but her parents don't even realize there's anything wrong with Bonnie right now, so if they're not distracted with their crying daughter, then there's no way they didn't either see the closet door open in their peripheral vision or hear the zipper of the backpack in this dead silent room. Whatever, moving on. Dolly is stunned that Woody managed to pull one over on her and he continues to spectate Bonnie as they roll up to the elementary school and head into the classroom. Despite Bonnie's reluctance to leave her mom's side, she softly waves goodbye as her teacher escorts her to her own personal cubbyhole to deposit her backpack. And for a moment, you think that maybe you'll like this new character due to how kind and considerate she is to Bonnie, only for her to turn around seconds later and immediately abandon Bonnie, leaving her no choice but to sullenly take a seat all by herself in the very back of the classroom. Why? Why are you this bad at your job? You just showed us two separate shots of the other students in the classroom all getting along and having found a table filled with other kids to socialize with, except for this dude who's about to lose his finger to a pencil sharpener. Who invited that kid? Everyone else already has a friend to get along with, and this galaxy brain of a teacher decides to completely abandon the only kid in the class who is completely alone, and who is obviously sad and scared to be here all by herself, and instead turn your attention to everyone else. Even something as simple as recommending she ask to sit with the other kids, or just escorting her over there herself would be leaps and bounds ahead of where she is currently, which is to just run around and desert her at the back of the classroom with nobody to talk to. Great. Awesome. Bonnie drew the moldy straw and got slotted into the home with the worst teacher on the planet. How are you still employed at this school when you show this little consideration for your students? Anyway, we completely skip over the meet and greet phase where the kids introduce themselves and jump straight into the arts and crafts stage where their assignment is to decorate a pencil holder for use when kindergarten begins proper. Bonnie begins to unleash her creativity to try to cheer herself up, but wait! A beacon of hope approaches her from the distance and her world lights up for just a split second as she thinks another kid has found it in his heart to come and sit with the lonely girl in the back of the room. Only it is revealed that this apple kid, we'll call him Steve, wasn't actually interested in her at all and just wanted her toys to play with. And so he completely ignores Bonnie and just takes the art supply box off her table for him to use all by himself. I'm not going to criticize the writing for this kid's actions because we all knew someone like this who wasn't content to use the shared art supply box for everyone, but instead had to take someone else's things for him to use all by himself. In fact, I'd even say that it's within his character since earlier we saw him steal this apple out of a girl's cubby and then when she tried to get it back, he just said nah. What I will criticize, however, is that once again, the teacher isn't doing diddly squat about this. She doesn't see him take the supplies, nor does she check in on Bonnie after the fact and notice that she doesn't have any supplies, nor does she notice that the table that he's at magically now has two boxes of supplies because Miss Wendy's the type of person to climb a glass wall to see what's on the other side. Either that or she has some deep-seated hatred for Bonnie that we're not quite privy to yet, but either way, she might actually be the worst teacher I've ever seen portrayed in any piece of media ever, and it is only because of this dingbat that the main plot device of this film is allowed to be created. <sighs> So Steve gets tired of eating his stolen apple and spits it out into the trash can, only he misses horribly and knocks out about half of the supplies into the bin along with the apple. This absolute moron managed to miss his shot so terribly that it landed inside the supply box, thus causing the supplies to topple out into the trash can. This kid may not be the stupidest person on the planet, but he'd better hope that that person doesn't die anytime soon. But that absolutely 
pales in comparison to what we are about to witness. Woody leaps out of the backpack and drops to the floor, stepping back into the cubbyhole behind him and hiding behind Bonnie's lunchbox? You just saw Woody hiding behind Bonnie's Battlesaur's lunchbox. What What do you mean that's Bonnie's lunchbox? She didn't have that on her when she walked into the classroom. How did this get into the cubbyhole? Did it teleport into the scene because Woody needed something to hide behind? Wait, wait, wait a minute. How did Woody even know this was here? He was in the backpack the whole time, so we couldn't have possibly have seen this was down here. Oh, but wait, it gets worse. Outside of the two kids that somehow don't see Woody despite running in his exact direction, and outside of the fact that the teacher doesn't care that these kids are running around the classroom when they're supposed to be working on their pencil holders, we are about to get a scene that is so jarring, I honestly wasn't convinced it was actually happening. So I'll run you through the whole scene, and then we'll talk about it. Woody uses this lunchbox as a moving cover piece to make his way over to the trash can, jumps into the trash can, throws a box of crayons towards Bonnie to distract her, grabs as many supplies as he can hold, and then completely abandons the idea of hiding behind the lunchbox to instead run directly behind Bonnie, climb up on top of her chair, toss the supplies onto her table, and then leap back into her backpack. WHAT?! What in the name of the Teletubbies did I just watch? You're telling me that absolutely nobody saw him do this. Really, not one single kid in this classroom was looking in this general direction, including the people sitting on this side of the tables, meaning that they'd be looking directly toward the cubbies. No one saw him moving in the peripheral vision. No one heard his footsteps. Bonnie didn't feel the vibrations in the floor or feel Woody whoosh past her. And even if we assume that every single one of these children is brain dead, how in the world did Miss Wendy not see anything? She may be a terrible teacher as established previously, but she still has a functioning pair of eyes. She didn't see the magical moving lunchbox or the magical moving cowboy. Also, why did Woody bother with the lunchbox at all if he wasn't going to use it for the return trip. Why would someone seeing a moving lunchbox be any less weird than someone seeing a moving cowboy doll? Finally, a spork is included among these supplies. But there were no sporks that fell out of that box, meaning that another kid used the spork at some point and then threw it away and yet it's somehow perfectly clean? That doesn't make any sense. This thing should be covered with half-eaten food and yet it's somehow perfectly pristine? Wait a minute, how is there even a spork in this trash can at all? This is kindergarten orientation. This is day one. Kids have been on vacation all summer long. Long, these bins would have been emptied out a long time ago. Why is this trash even full in the first place? And why would a spork be included among these things? How does Woody toss the crayon box all the way over to right next to Bonnie's table when the arc was shown should have just immediately crashed to the ground in front of him? Nothing in this scene makes any sense! And don't even try to tell me that criticizing the idea that there would even be a spork in this trash can at all when there haven't been any kids around for months is a silly minor thing to get hung up on. Because this movie's plot revolves entirely around Bonnie having this eating utensil. This is a critical plot point. And yes, you heard me correctly. This spork is going to define the central plot of this film. How is that the case, you may ask? Well, it's simple. After regaining her confidence, Bonnie uses the supplies Woody retrieved for her to convert this spork into a brand new character, Forkface. Well, okay, well, his name is actually Forky, but I will not be doing this googly-eyed garbage spawn the service of referring to him by his proper name, so Forkface it is! Oh, now you decide you want to start paying attention to Bonnie? Where were you two minutes ago when she was about to start crying her eyes out because she was scared and alone in an unfamiliar location? This fast food builder knockoff didn't give one singular hoot about her before, but now that she's all sunshine and rainbows, you're just chatting up a storm with her? Absolute waste of oxygen and tax dollars. This is the state of the education system. Also, wait a minute, you're pleased with her for crafting this abomination? Really? Because the assignment was for everyone to be decorating pencil holders, and she didn't even kind of try to follow the instructions. Now, I'm not blaming her for doing this. She's new to kindergarten, she wanted to express her creativity, and I'm happy she was able to. But there's no way in the world you're gonna get me to believe that this teacher wouldn't have been displeased with Bonnie for going entirely off task. <sighs> anyway, orientation goes by in a flash, and then we see Steve completely ignore his dad as he runs away. Yeah, your kid's kind of a useless, chewed-up wad of bubblegum who steals people's belongings. You might want to do something about that. Whatever, Bonnie is reunited with her parents and is happy that she finished kindergarten only for her parents to utterly crush her hopes and dreams and reveal that she's doomed to be sucked into the never-ending, horrific spiral of the education system for the next 12 years of her life and possibly even longer. Then Bonnie's dad, who has no scripted name, but I'll be referring to him as uh, Magnum, realizes his blunder and immediately tries to lift Bonnie's spirits up by telling her that they're going on a road trip? I... Uh, really? You're, you're going on a road trip the day after kindergarten orientation? Apparently school doesn't start for another week, which I guess it's not technically a proper criticism since there's nothing that would implicitly make this impossible, but I mean, every orientation I ever went through in school happened the day before school began properly. I, I don't know, I just, I just find it a little strange that there's such a massive gap between orientation and the first day of school, and even weirder that her parents waited until the absolute last possible week of summer vacation to take her on this road trip. But whatever, we've got way bigger fish to fry in this movie than that. 
but sadly that's where we're gonna have to stop for the day. I'm gonna try to keep these videos at around an hour each, although I imagine the further into this wretched abomination we get, the longer these videos are gonna start to become. Because for as terrible as this film is so far, for as little sense as each scene makes, and for as mercilessly as it has already started dealing irreparable damage to beloved characters, we have barely scratched the surface of what is wrong with this movie. When I first saw this film in theaters on opening day, it stunned me to silence because I could not believe that Pixar had not only just turned out one of the most logically broken movies ever made, but also one that seemed to go out of its way to tear down every character and meaningful message established by those original three glorious movies. Remember what they did to Jesse? Yeah. That was nothing. That was weak sauce compared to what horrors await us later in this travesty. So buckle your seatbelts and keep your hands, arms, feet, and legs inside the ride at all times, everyone, because this nightmare has only just begun. Thanks for watching, everyone. I hope this video brought some problems to your attention that you previously missed, because good lord almighty did the whole world seem to miss a whole lot of problems with this movie. My goal is going to be to get the next episode out by sometime next weekend, but I'm not about to do a repeat of Danganronpa 3 and drive myself insane trying to meet a deadline. So that date is certainly subject to change, but you can still keep an on my Twitter to receive updates on when the future episodes of the series will be out. We've got one down so far, we still have four more to go. And boy oh boy is it gonna be one wild ride. Other than that, I'd like to once again thank you all for watching, and hope to see you soon for the next part of how Toy Story 4 destroyed everything. Goodbye!